Good evening. My name is Tarun Wadhu, and it's my pleasure to be here tonight to introduce my father, Vivek. Vivek has been a voice of clarity and conscience for millions of people through his columns, his classes, his lectures. He's been a serial entrepreneur. He's been a professor at six different universities. It's crazy. <laughs> He's authored four books and thousands of articles and publications all around the world. Six years ago, he achieved the incredible distinction of being named by the federal government as an outstanding American by choice. Before that, Foreign Policy Magazine named him one of the top global thinkers, and as we just heard, Time Magazine named him one of the top 40 most influential minds in tech. But I would argue that his resume is not what's gotten him this far in life. Rather, it's a unique way that he looks at the world. He has this outlook that's both bottom-up and people-first, while being deeply rooted in pragmatism. Vivek's guiding conviction is that anything is possible and that everything can be improved upon. Now, what I personally find most impressive about his time in Silicon Valley is something that no one ever mentions, that we rarely ever talk about. And that's the tens of thousands, I'm sure by now, of meetings that you've taken at your second office, the Starbucks on Sharon Park Road. <laughs> Without ever asking for anything in return, I've seen you do this over and over again. You regularly meet with aspiring entrepreneurs and leaders. You provide them with your advice, your feedback, your wisdom, your guidance and assistance. You remember what it was like to be in their shoes, and because of that, you're always willing to help them find their path. To me, that is what exemplifies the same spirit of progress that's at the heart of Silicon Valley. It's this idea that, this belief that the future is, a, is in the process of being created every single day still. That we all have a part to play in bringing it to life. That humanity is fundamentally good. And that people can do incredible things when they join together. Dad, we're enormously proud of you and your contributions. It is my great honor to invite you up here to receive this year's Visionary Award. You know, my greatest and my only advantage is my family, my two sons, Vineet and Tarun, and the super women that they have as wives, Ruhi and Nisha. I mean, uh, the women basically are the leaders in our houses. My wife, you know, um, Kevin talked about the heart attack I had. 15 years ago, I, it wasn't clear whether I would survive or not. My wife, Tevinder, didn't let me die. Three and a half days, she was awake by my side. She would not let me die. I mean, this is what happens with, this is why I'm such a champion of women, because I've seen that not even God can fight amazing women. <laughs> and this is why I'm here today, because she would not give up. She said, Vivek, we're not going to um, lose this war. You're going to live. And I did live. And I had to reinvent myself, and I became an academic. So, you know, for me to be up here today is a big surprise because I'm not known for being um, a proponent of Silicon Valley. I've been a big critic of Silicon Valley. And I'm nowhere in the same league as the 102 people that Kevin talked about. You know, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Andy Grove, Astro Teller, Kimberly Bryant. I mean, you know, I mean, Katrina. I mean, these are amazing people. And for me to be in the same league as them seems, you know, just incredible. I'm not worthy. Now, I'm not complaining, by the way. <laughs> but I don't believe I'm worthy. You know, I moved to um, uh, Silicon Valley in 2009, and the official party line was that I came here to research U.S. competitive advantage. The real reason I came here was because Tevinder said, Vivek, we're moving to Silicon Valley, and that's why we moved here. <laughs> but uh, when I came here, I tried to, you know, I, seriously, I was researching why immigrants had been so successful over here. I had worked with Annalise Saxion of UC Berkeley to document that 52% of the startups in Silicon Valley were founded by people born abroad from 1995 to 2005. Indians dominated the, the, um, the immigrant groups. Why is it that immigrants dominated here? What was magical about Silicon Valley? So this is what I came here to research. And what the results of the research showed was that it was very simple. It was the culture and diversity of Silicon Valley that gave it its advantage, that indeed it was, an, it was a, um, a melting pot. You had brilliant people from all over the world coming here and competing and collaborating and working together. And Silicon Valley welcomed diversity, it welcomed um, dissent, it wel welcomed you know, thoughts. As Astro keeps talking about, it also embraced failure. Right? So this is the magic of Silicon Valley. 
So for a long time, I was Silicon Valley's cheerleader. If you read my articles from uh, the early 2000s, I would talk about how amazing it was and, and how it would rule the world and so on. Yeah. And then something happened. We went to a TechCrunch event, and my wife, Devinda, was sitting next to me, and she just says, Vivek, do you notice something different over here, something strange? I said, yeah, we're sitting next to Mark Zuckerberg, and he's wearing a hoodie. <laughs> she says, no, um, where are the women? And I looked around, and there weren't any women there. And then, where are the blacks? Where are the Hispanics? Suddenly, you know, the, uh, my, the light went off in my head saying, something is wrong over here. That despite all of its advantages, despite all the good things I've been saying about it, something is strangely wrong. That when I talked about diversity, I was talking about diversity in nationality. It never occurred to me that you know, the gender was missing. I didn't even document that in my research. So then I started um, researching it further. I started writing about it. I wrote a whole series of articles. Um, you go back and read my articles from 2009, 2010. I was brutal about uh, the lack of diversity, the, the, uh, the fact that we were leaving out half of the population in Silicon Valley. And that led to... Um, vicious attacks by people I respected. I mean, these, you know, Silicon Valley moguls, people I held in the highest regard, they ripped into me like you won't believe. I mean, they called me a fraud, they called me a fake, they called me the carrot top. I mean, God knows, every insult in the book. And I was, you know, rather scared of taking on these power brokers. You're talking about billionaires. You're talking about who's who, people that you read about, that you looked up to for the longest time. And the they wouldn't let me back off. She says, Vivek, if you don't speak up for, for, for these people, who will? That sort of you know, hit me very hard and motivated me to be even more vocal. Now, the beauty of Silicon Valley is that it recognizes that it's imperfect. It reinvents itself. And over the last couple of years, the Valley has been beating itself up, rightfully so, and it has become acutely aware of its deficiencies. It's reinventing itself. We're not there yet, we're far from it. But the fact that we can have these discussions openly without people screaming at me is a big deal, right? This is why I'm so optimistic about Silicon Valley. And what's more, I've also been researching immigration. When I, uh, despite the fact I had been brutal about the venture capital firms, when I went to Mark Andreessen, when I went to Reid Hoffman, when I went to Elon Musk and said I wanted an endorsement for my book, Immigrant Exodus, I got my emails returned within five minutes and they wholeheartedly supported me. They wholeheartedly supported me in my battle for skilled immigrants. Not to say that I was successful because we regressed over the last uh, year or so, but nevertheless, the Valley was very, very supportive. And that is what defines Silicon Valley, that it's um, the contradiction and the, um, uh, I mean, the diversity and the, you know, the open thinking that you have over here. It's like no place in the world that you can compete and you can collaborate at the same time. So talking about reinvention, a reinvention is happening now like never before. That the same semiconductors that uh, made the Silicon Valley what it is are now powering advances in fields as diverse as artificial intelligence, robotics, network sensors, um, synthetic biology. There are amazing advances happening here and I sincerely believe that within the next 10 or 15 years, we have the ability to solve the grand challenges of humanity itself. What are the grand challenges of humanity? Living here in Silicon Valley, we're clueless because we don't see the poverty, we don't see the hunger, we don't see the despair. Yes, we see some poverty on the streets of San Francisco, but we walk by it pretending there's nothing there. We don't see the, uh, the, you know, the, the problems of the world. Within the next decade or decade and a half, we will be in an era of unlimited and almost free and clean energy. This is unstoppable. No matter what the government does to bring back beautiful coal, we won't do it. <laughs> the developing world is driving the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the advances and we will have an era of unlimited, clean and almost free energy. We will be able to educate billions of people in the world through AI and virtual reality. We will be able to cure practically every disease and prevent it. We will be able to solve problem after problem after problem of the world. This is what technology is enabling right now. It is absolutely incredible, it's absolutely amazing. At the same time, we have the ability to uh, create killer robots. 
we have the ability to bring back lethal viruses. You know, we, we have the ability to now create runaway AI. We have the ability to create drones that are going to be bombing schools and populations. The same technologies that can do good can do evil. Technology is now advancing on this exponential curve. And it's incredible what is possible. Now, here's what the problem and the opportunity and the challenge is, that the people who should be providing the, uh, the guidance, taking us into the amazing Star Trek future that we can build right, right now. Seriously, we have the ability to create Star Trek 300 years ahead of what you saw on TV. We really literally have the ability to create Star Trek. People like Astro Teller are already doing it. I mean, he's, I mean, he's someone I look up to, uh, and he's already taking us there. The, the type of crazy things that Google is doing are incredible. So we have the ability to do that, but at the same time, if you look at it, we're creating a wide gap between the haves and the have-nots. We are now uh, creating all sorts of policy issues with technologies that no one understands. Normally, it would be policymakers and academics who would be, the academics would be publishing papers and policymakers would be creating policy and we would be coming to a consensus on what's ethical and what's not ethical and that's the way you know, laws work. But the people who create these laws are clueless. Society doesn't even understand what these technologies are. There's such a wide gap between us and the rest of America that you know, soon light from the Midwest won't reach Silicon Valley in a million years because there's such a wide gap between these two worlds, right? So there's no one to now guide us into this future. There's no one to now develop the regulations and the policies and the controls we need to make sure that we use technology in a wise way to solve the grand challenges of humanity and to build a Star Trek future. The only people who can do it are us. So you know, the question is, if we don't do it, who will? So we have to step up to the, um, uh, to the table over here. We have to now figure out how to solve these problems and to uplift humanity because we can do it. This is the most amazing period in human history. We have to come together now and make it happen. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Silicon Valley Forum, for this incredible award.